Um, it's a pleasure uh, to speak here at this event. And um, I'm actually one of these experimentalists mentioned by Arthur in his presentation. So I work on experimental quantum technologies. And my goal in the next few minutes is actually to kind of give you a, a bit of an idea of how the real world looks like, so building quantum computers and what the challenges are. As said, I'm in photonics, so the, the quantum system I will focus on is photonic quantum computing. Um, there are plenty of quantum systems in the world and plenty of approaches building quantum computers. So you could ask yourself, why should you care about photons? And this is what I'm trying to tell you in the next 10 minutes. And, and one important reason um, may be that you may have seen this, uh, the news articles a few, um, two years ago now, where um, photonics have demonstrated a quantum advantage. So where photonic systems have demonstrated some capability that could not easily be computed in the, in the classical world. Um, when we deal with photons, we have to know photons are special. Um, we have plenty of photons around here, so photons are basically single quanta of light. Um, and the, the, the goal is not to take a single quantum, so of these like billions and billions of photons, and to be able to control it with a precision that we can actually do computation with it. And the other thing that is special about photons, they fly with the speed of light. So you have a quantum system that you want to control that flies so fast that it flies uh, 7.5 times around the Earth in one second. And this is now the system you want to do computation with. As said, what is required, we need to take these single photons that fly at the speed of light um, and control them with a precision that we can encode information and perform computations with them. And this means we need to build uh, experiments, laboratory experiments, and we need to build systems that allow us to do that. And for example, you can take special lasers and crystals, or you take single quantum emitters, like single atoms, that you control very, very precisely. And as stressed before, this is not simple experiments. These are difficult experiments to do. And this is a kind of picture from such how such an experiment looks like in a laboratory these days. So this is just to control a few photons, to manipulate a few photons, and to build a small-scale quantum computers. That's a very difficult task to do. Um, but nevertheless, we are at a position now where we can do these tasks. One nice thing about these photons is that they have various ways to encode information in them. So we can use many degrees of freedom, we can play with many things, we have many possibilities to actually implement computation. And because our photonic qubit is so different, also photonic quantum computing is kind of even more different from uh, like the standard quantum computing you may know. You, so you don't have a, a computer that sits there and just is like you can control, but you're flying qubits and these flying qubits um, behave differently. And one thing that is also special about photons is you don't have direct interaction. So if you want to do computation, you want to have some qubits or in classical computation, you have some bits. In quantum computation, you have some qubits. And you want to do operations on these qubits. And now in photonic systems, you have two photons, and they just don't talk to each other, right? So this is actually a wrong picture. When you shine two photons or two beams into each other, they basically don't care. So qubit one doesn't want to talk to qubit two. And this is why in photonics we have to find some workarounds or we have to come up with new methods how to do quantum computing. And one of the tricks we do is we, we create a bigger system. So we start with many more photons, many more qubits than what we actually need. And then we measure a few of those photons. We send those through some circuits. And we can create some kind of artificial interaction there. Um, and this is how we make our photons talk to each other. So we kind of create a bigger system, we perform some measurements, and this um, is some kind of artificial interaction we can create. And this shows again that photonic systems are kind of non-standard. Um, and that 
it shows also how we can build photonic quantum computers. So the ingredients we need for photonic quantum computers is we have some integrated circuits, some light sources, um, some single photons or some states of light that travel into these circuits. We have some kind of um, devices where we kind of generate beam splitters, so some, some structures onto the light. We have some elements where we do some active switching and we need some detectors. So this is kind of a um, next picture of how you can imagine a photonic quantum processor. So this is a small one, this would be a few qubit one, um, but basically you generate light, you send light through circuits, you perform some operations and you do some measurements. And now you can show that you can use this actually also to perform quantum computing. Um, as said, this is a, a small scale processor of a few qubits. And if we want to kind of build large scale processor, we need many, many qubits. So we need to scale this up to large, large dimensions. And um, the question is, why don't we have kind of hundreds of thousands of photonic qubits yet? And this is because these experiments or this, like, uh, building the systems is a very difficult task. And there are a few particular challenges that we are working on and that we face and that we have to find a way around. So I show you this, this picture of this like, optics laboratory in the beginning. And this was maybe an experiment which had four qubits involved. And now if you think you won't have 40 qubits, you will need at least 10 times the, the space of what I showed you in this picture. So what we need for photonics is integration, so going small-scale integrated circuits. So basically what we, what we do in photonics, and the, the, one of the big bottlenecks is to shrink these optical setups from sizes of meters, really macroscopic distances, <coughs> to like small-scale <coughs> devices like millimeters, so small-scale photonic chips. And now if you kind of have on the, on the left-hand side four qubits, and so on the right-hand side is four qubits as well, but if you want to scale these chips up to larger sizes, it's much, much easier and it's much more stable. So the one challenge in photonic quantum computing is really getting the systems integrated and having high-quality um, high integrated circuits. And this shows also that it's not just a physics challenge, but it's also an engineering challenge. So we need not just physicists, but we need engineers, we need people working on integration. We need also computer scientists bringing everything together to kind of shrink these setups to these small sizes. The second challenge we're dealing with in photonics is photon loss, and that's also special to photonics. Um, usually when you talk about quantum computers, you have your qubits sitting there in the computers and they are just there. Photons fly around and they scatter and they may just disappear at some point. So you may just lose your qubit. And in order to solve this challenge, again, there's also fundamental research needed. So we need concepts how we can deal with systems, how we can do computation on systems where we lose our qubits. And at the same time, there's another approach. So we need to have hardware that kind of minimizes losses. So we need integrated circuits with minimal losses, high transmission. And here you see, again, you need the basic research on the computer science side. You need the research on the engineering side, and you need to bring everything together to solve this challenge. Um, but however, what's the state of the art of photonic quantum computing? When we talk about universal quantum computing, um, there have been implementations of quantum algorithms um, on a small scale, and small scale means four, five, six qubits. So there have been demonstrations of Shor's algorithm, of Grover's algorithm. Um, this has been all demonstrated in small scales, but what is really needed is now the scaling up. Um, I also like to mention there are a few startups actually working on photonic quantum computing. Um, I'm not involved in any of them, so this is just a selection of those who are kind of uh, prominent these days. And um, also I would like to stress that at University of Stuttgart I'm leading a consortium which actually focuses on tackling these challenges and building a photonic quantum processor to have some um, scaling of photonic quantum technologies. So I started with actually talking about photonics has shown a quantum advantage. Now I just told you we have four or 
five qubits. So what is this quantum advantage about? Well, we can scale photonic systems up, and there have been two demonstrations with high numbers of photons, so 60, um, 76 photons and 219 photons. And these were on the left-hand side, you again see a huge bulky experiment for controlling these 76 photons. And on the uh, right-hand side, you see a nice kind of integrated fiber-based experiment with a larger number of photons. And what these two experiments showed is that they could compute a task that was not um, possible to compute classically. So they could, uh, it's kind of a bit of an artificial task, and um, they could kind of create an experiment which solved this task, but um, a classic computer couldn't in a reasonable time. And this is very impressive because this is very impressive photon numbers and very impressive experiments. Um, the question is now, can this be useful for any application? And the question is, the answer is maybe, potentially. We don't know yet. So again, there is some research required. It's not just a solved problem, but we have here powerful systems that um, can do things, but we don't know what the potential applications may be. And on the other hand, we have universal systems that we need to scale up, so we need to bring everything also together. And as a last point, because it's a quantum and AI conference, I also wanted to kind of say a few words on this, because often we talk about quantum for AI, so how can we develop AI or um, have an advantage in, in AI from quantum? But I would also like to mention that an interesting question is how can we use AI in quantum? especially to the AI people here. So how can we use AI to design better hardware, to design better software, to come up with new quantum computing schemes and also for questions like data analysis? Um, so I think the quantum for AI part is clear, but what's important for me is also the AI for quantum, so bringing the things together from two ends, and that's something I'd be happy to discuss also here during these two days. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs>